Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the hosts and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have a problem with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West, transmitting across the internet. This is the Halloween Ah 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 episode 151 of Registry Matters. Hey, Larry, what's up? Oh, I love that sound effect. How about that? Oh, Where did people that come in chat from? are already saying they're scared. Where did that come from? Uh, I, if I told you, then we would end up with a copyright infringement and we would get a takedown order. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> what do we have going on tonight, Larry? Well, we have some, some almost late breaking news from uh, Georgia. From the Peach State. Okay. Peach State, eh? Is it peachy news? Well, it's not as optimistic as, it's not as fantastic as we would hope for. And we've got, we've got some listener questions from inside, behind the walls, and from outside. And I think we might have a story or two. And okay. uh, and, and then someone wrote to us with a suggestion of how to get the podcast better dis- distributed. And since I don't understand it, you're going to explain that. Oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. Is uh is is this evening a special night by any chance for the PFRs of the, the United States? Depends on what state they're in. I think I think it's Halloween across the country at the time we're recording. But some of our states uh, or our supervising authorities take a very uh, limited view of Halloween in terms of what a person's allowed to do. And in my state, they require them if they're under supervision to take off work, make arrangements to not work on this date to satisfy the stay-at-home order. And that really bugs me that they do that because it's hard enough to find employment, particularly in COVID-19, and to say, I won't come to work on a Saturday, which in retail, I think right now the retail establishments where people work are booming. Uh, you know, box stores are just filled with people and, and uh, the grocery stores are filled with people. So it, it kind of bugs me that, that people are not allowed to work. I went to, I went out to lunch and uh, I, I don't, I don't even think of Halloween as a thing, to be honest with you. And all the wait staff was wearing costumes. There was like an astronaut and there was uh, somebody dressed as Michael Jackson and he was actually like dancing at tables. It was a, uh, uh, it was, it was very entertaining. So I didn't, I didn't remember costumes being a big thing in Georgia back in my day, but it, it always has been here. Don't you think that, I think I've heard you say something to the effect of, there might be something of a First Amendment challenge at Halloween for things like the costumes. I believe there there is uh, there there's certainly the right for people to express themselves and to and to decorate and uh, you know that's one of our most cherished rights. And without any narrow tailoring, I believe that those type of restrictions would be extremely vulnerable to to challenge that you have to refrain. It comes back to having having the financial resources to fight the government and and having the uh, legal team that's willing to be in a protracted battle we're going to be talking about tonight, one that's already a year old. And and that's that's the short side of uh, they generally drag on for multi years. But uh, I think I think that would be something that would be vulnerable to challenge to require everyone not to decorate. Maybe you could come up with some individualized circumstances for a particular offender where they would not be allowed to do that. But just across the board, that's real problematic. So, and, and I guess what somebody has to do is like decorate their house and then let them come in and be on n- nasty about it and take you off to, to have somebody, you know, with skin in the game, having sta- standing, I guess is the term. That's correct on the standing. You wouldn't necessarily have to to risk arrest because to have this requisite standing, there has to be a bona fide threat. So if you're given a directive that you cannot decorate, then you would have the requisite standing. You would not have to wait because the certainty of arrest is almost imminent. If they tell you if you do these things, you're going to be arrested. The problem with that waiting to that, uh, they generally disseminate these directives a week or 10 days out for Halloween Correct. and you don't you don't get a lot of advance notice so therefore trying to gear up for a legal challenge is difficult because 
if you file this year for what's going to happen next year, we get into the international maintenance law situation. It's speculative. You okay. have to opine to the judge that's hearing the case for your restraining order that you believe, based on prior practice, that they will be an order come down 10 days before Halloween that says you can't do these things. And that doesn't give you really time to gear up for a preliminary injunction hearing. And the states where it would be more easier to do that would be one like in Tennessee, where they have it in the statute. It's not a policy, but it's a statute. Okay. They have that they have that 10 or 11 day period where you're not allowed to do things. There's no speculation at all. And that that's on the books. And, and, and so if you are in, within the zone of the people covered by that statute, you would have the requisite standing and you could you could file without waiting till they put the handcuffs on you. So I don't like to ha- tell people to wait be, to be handcuffed. Uh, that ha- being handcuffed is unpleasant and all the consequences that go with that. But sometimes that is really the only reasonable alternative is to be handcuffed. And then they're still going to argue, like if they were to handcuff you and take you to jail for violating the Halloween directive, they're going to argue once you finally get before a judge, they're going to say, it's now moot because Halloween's over. We're ready to let him go. <laughs> I'm wondering, I was wondering if, like, I mean, you know, do you, if you, if you were so inclined and had the resources, do you go hire an attorney sometime in the summer to, to just spool everything up? And as soon as they come out with it, that you would have already your guns loaded, ready to fire, that you could, you know, shoot them down a week, 10 days in advance and, and, and run into the court system immediately. Yes. That's what you do. Okay. Good grief. So, and you know, we're talking many thousands of dollars. Many thousands of dollars. Yes. Uh, what about, uh, you know, my, my curfew this evening started at 5 p.m. and ends at 7 a.m. tomorrow. Is there anything there, there? Again, with, with, with any order that has no narrow tailoring that intrudes on a fundamental right, there's vulnerability because you have, you have some fundamental rights that, that are enshrined in the Constitution. Are you... Are you being precluded from doing something that's fundamentally your right to do? Because clearly, supervised defenders can can be can be restricted in their movements. That that is a given. But if they have a blanket policy that tells every supervised defender you cannot move between these hours, and there's no exceptions for hardship or anything, then those factors weigh more in your favor. Because if they can't articulate a reason for you to be immobilized, what are you, do you have a curfew normally? Are you restricted to your domicile in, in, on normal days, or can you be out gallivanting the streets? Uh, and is that you're actually pointed to asking me that question? Uh, yes, I'm asking you that question. Know. I don't know. Uh, are you are you under any restrictions in terms of curfew? Because here, every person yeah. who is under a sex offender supervision, they already have a curfew. So this is nothing new. This is nothing new, but this is an extended one. This is extra uh, restriction. Mine is normally well, 9 p.m. Until what time? Uh you know, I mean, I go out and exercise, you know, it's supposed to be like seven in the morning or something like that. So uh, anything that can't be anything that 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 intrudes in a fundamental right without any narrow tailoring is vulnerable. But I don't know that you have the gobs of money or would be in your interest to, to oh, challenge no. that in view of the circumstances that you're in. And that's what a lot of yeah, people sure. have to consider. They have to consider what the re- adverse ramifications would be. The money is the, is the major barrier. But there are also other considerations. We need a bunch of people to, to throw grenades and jump on them. <laughs> now that's going right. to cause us. To, that's going to cause us to be banned because of that word. There's the, there's a big government listening device right now that just picked up on the grenade. Yeah, no, but I didn't use the B word, the four letter B word. So well, the grenade's probably being tracked also. Hmm, I don't know. The grenade doesn't sound nearly that bad. You know, like horseshoes and hand grenades. But that other word, that. That. All right. Anywho. All right. We should move on. We have uh, we have some some questions that we're going to go over before we uh, hit the featured event. Shall we dig into Robert's question in Georgia? Let's do our best. And uh, so his question is, uh, during sentencing, the public defender stopped the judge to have me sign the unsigned plea papers. Is that legal? Does it give me grounds for a habeas habeas corpus? I. I even to me, Larry, just like does had me sign the unsigned plea papers. When else would you sign them? Oh, you could sign them at any point. the 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 plea offer is usually extended to the 
I'm saying usually, it's not a given, but usually extended well in advance. The, process, the negotiations are going back and forth and you may get a, you may get a m multiple offers and counter offers and at, at, at the time that, that, that you and your client come to an agreement, the, the, it could be signed before court. What he's referring to is, that, is uh, what I'm guessing, he, he d does not write very clearly, nor does he communicate his key points very succinctly. So it, it forces us to have to guess. So I'm guessing what happened was that on the day he was hauled to court, he had not agreed to the plea, and the the plea proceeding was taking uh, taking place, and the judge had called the case, and he's saying that the attorney pressured him at that point. He doesn't use the word pressure, but he's implying that the attorney pressured him to sign it right then, and that that that's what he's wanting to know if there's a habeas for that and the answer is probably not because even if he signed it even if everything he described is exactly as he as as I'm as I'm inferring from what he what he he didn't say if everything was exactly like that the 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 process requires a, an individual addressing of the person the defendant in open court and all those questions they ask you they're pretty standardized across the country uh, because it's based on Supreme Court ruling, which I can't cite the case. But there's an individual admonishment of all these things to understand whether you're competent, whether your attorney has explained everything to you, uh, and if you're satisfied with your attorney's representation. Yeah, and he and he that would have been the time for him to have said no. Nobody does it, but that's the time for him to have said, "Well, Your Honor, actually." I don't like this plea agreement. I just got it today. I haven't had a chance to consider it. And my attorney has told me if I don't sign it, I'm going to go to prison for 200 years. But he didn't say that. Correct. He said, he Correct. said yes, yes. He answered every, every question correctly to the judge's satisfaction. So therefore, the likelihood is very low, not impossible, but very low he would be able to set aside that plea on a habeas corpus proceeding. And real quick, what is habeas? Well, it's a, it's a, it's nothing more than a vessel that's used a legal, a legal, a legal uh, process when you don't have anything else. When you've pled guilty or no contest, you don't have a lot of appeal options uh, in terms of undoing it. So, so then the 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 few remaining vessels you have is is habeas corpus. You can say that that uh, it's a it's a Latin term to to bring the person before the court and justify their detention. So you use that vehicle to challenge your confinement, saying that I shouldn't be confined because this plea was not bona fide, correct? Because here's the things that render that plea invalid. Almost all of those are turned down because the hmm. process, all they'll do is look at the transcript and see that he answered yes, no, yes, no to everything correctly. And 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 as far as his incompetence, what, what people like to do, and I'm going off on a tangent here, what people like to do is they like to pretend like they're incompetent after they've done the plea. Right. They 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 don't raise. You're presumed competent. That's one of the presumptions that that that, that goes with you when when you're accused of a crime. Everybody's presumed competent, and and unless some evidence surfaces to the contrary, that presumption stays with you through the duration of the proceeding. And what happens is, it, 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 during the plea process, they generally ask, "Are you under the influence of any medication or any drugs illegal that would render you incapable?" Well. You're going to catch 22 because if you say, yes, I'm all doped up, that was a violation of your conditions of release if you write on release. So they're going to lock you up for violating your conditions of release because you said, yes, I'm on illegal drugs. And if you say, no, I'm not under the influence of any, anything that would re re render me incapable, then you have the new problem because you, 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 you indicated that you were not. Uh, you were not incompetent. I've gotten letter after letter after letter through the years. Well, I was I was high. I was this. I was on that. I, when I did the plea, I didn't understand it. You didn't tell the judge that. You told the judge you weren't. <laughs> I, I have to tell, tell you from personal experience, the way that they did it here is you're in uh, – I, what is what would be the room be called where you're like signing those final paperwork? I mean, like here it was right next. It was attached to the courtroom and the courtroom is loud. Uh, or maybe it was uh, all the other holding cells were right there and you're trying to sign this stuff. Anyway, it was loud. Yeah, it had to be right attached to the courtroom because like the court was telling us we were being too loud. I couldn't hear my attorney. And she's like, hey, you got to sign these 45 blocks. Initial, initial. And I'm in cuffs. It was 
it was a very uh, distressing. It was it was not a a happy situation. Well, and you had the opportunity to tell the judge I wasn't able with the handcuffs to review the documents I was signing. So therefore, yeah. I, I I'm going to tell the court I really didn't know what I was signing, and they would have suspended suspended the proceedings, and the judge shouldn't have taken the plea, and the judge would have said, counselor. Make sure your client understands what we're doing because I don't want this case to come back up on appeal. That's what right. would have happened. Somehow it seems like that would have gone poorly for me in the end. Uh, I don't Maybe think so. Maybe the DA I, then withdraws everything and, and starts ratcheting things up, making stuff worser. Well, uh, the, the DA shouldn't have done that. I can't say what the DA would have done. But it's imperative that you understand what you're doing. And that these these are life altering decisions, and and if you don't understand yeah. something, when the judge asking asking you, did you understand it? If you didn't, the time to say is no, I didn't. And and nobody does that. I I explained that to a, to a federal judge when I went to a to a, a, a national defense lawyers annual meeting in in uh, uh, Philadelphia some years ago. He's now a circuit judge, but he was a he was a district judge then, and he said that that, that he makes sure that he goes the extra mile. He said, I make sure that, that, I, that I take the time with each individual defendant. And I said, well, he may, he, may, he may present himself as being a great guy. And I said, well, is that you're doing that in the interest of making sure the defendant knows what they're doing, or are you interested in closing the door on habeas corpus? And he looked at me like he thought there was, like, like where's this guy come from? But as a judge, what do, you, what do you expect the person to do when they're in this situation? When the person that they is their advocate, because they ask you one of the questions is, are you happy with your attorney? That would be like asking mm-hmm. me when I was in foster care in front of my <laughs> foster parents, are you happy with how the this family has been treating you as a foster child? What or is, a, is a 12-year-old or 10-year-old kid going to say? Yes. And so I asked the judge likely. that. Yes, they're the best. So I asked the judge that. What would you expect when your advocate is standing at your side? And, you, and you're asked, are you satisfied with the work that person's done? What would you expect the answer to be? Sure. And he acted like he, he, he may mumble something to the fact that he, had, he hadn't really thought about it from that perspective, but he said he doesn't know. And he, there is really no other alternative. You can't ex parte the defendant because that's not fair to the other side. So the judge doesn't get to go have a private conversation without any lawyers present and ask, are you satisfied? He has to do it in open court, he or she because judges are women also, but but it, you you can't export the, the so so it's it's a catch twenty two for the judge. All right, let's move over to the snarky question. It says, "I'm disappointed after listening to Registry Matters episode one hundred fifty. You two never seem to be positive on anything, even when there's a fantastic victory like the one in the Mississippi Supreme Court. Larry always seems to dash our hopes when he makes his predict. Isn't that from Louisiana, Larry, not uh, Mississippi?" Forgive me. Uh, Did we yes, have the driver's license one? Okay, so yes. let me back up then. Uh, even when there's a fantastic victory like the one in Louisiana Supreme Court, Larry always seems to dash our hopes when he makes his predictions that they will simply do a new marking on the license. Isn't it just as likely that they will realize the error and let the issue die and fade away? A positive attitude will be great once in a while. You two are something else. I'm, I'm thinking in my head, he probably was saying, you people or something else. <laughs> so, well, other than the state being wrong, that's a good question. Uh, but what what I, uh, I guess I can apologize, but I don't know what I can do about it. I apologize for coming across as negative, but I don't know what I can do about it because the likelihood of them just letting this issue die and fade away is very remote. And I say that based on the evidence we had in front of us. We had, based on the Supreme Court's research, we had a finding that Louisiana was one of only nine states that marked driver's license in any way. And within those nine, they indicated that many of them were very discreetly done. They also opined that, that, that Louisiana's was the worst. I've never carried a Louisiana or any of the state's marked driver's license, so I don't know which is the worst, but I'm taking their word for it because their analysis was that it was the most obnoxious marking in the, in the nation. So I'm looking at the evidence we have and what we know, and then I'm looking at what we, what we know about how systems operate and how, how this is a political decision that has to be made. The, 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 the lawmaker, lawmakers are going to be 
confronted with the decision to just simply let the licenses be unmarked going forward, or they, they're going to be told by the law enforcement apparatus that clearly the court said we can do it as long as it's not as intrusive as it was being done previously. They said that. And the roadmap is there. So you would have to be an extremely optimistic person to believe that they would go from being the worst state in the country to just simply letting it fade away. Is it possible? Yes, it's remotely possible that they would do that. But I think it's so remote that if I were to say that, 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 that I think this is going to be a fade away and be forgotten about, I think the listeners should abandon uh, us altogether as being a reliable source of inf- information because I don't believe that to be what's going to happen. I believe they're going to try to mark the licenses again in some capacity. I don't know what they'll try to do yet, but I, d- I don't believe they'll let this just fade away. But I guess I, I can answer the question with a question. Do you want us to tell you what you'd like to hear when, when we analyze these things or what, or what we think is likely to be the trajectory of what's happening going forward? I can tell you what super patron Mike usually says, like always says, is that he appreciates when we tell it to him straight, but he wouldn't want us to tell it to him any other way. He doesn't want us to try and make it all happy sounding and, and this and that. You know, I mean, it was a, it is an excellent victory for those people, but that would, if you were playing a game of chess with someone and you made some incredible move to defend against their attack, they're not going to just go, ah, oh, crap, they really defended well and they lay down their queen and you win. They're probably going to make another play to push back against your defense. They're going to keep pushing. That's my expectation. Now, if all of a sudden the people of Louisiana rise up by large numbers and say, we find it appalling that we were putting scarlet letters on our driver's license. Now we know this. We demand that you don't enact any more laws to this effect. That could happen. Based on the years I've been in advocacy, I have not heard of a population rising up against anything that's done to PFRs. So that would be a first. But could it happen? I guess it's possible. It could happen. Am am I wrong in my assumption that it comes back to us if we turned around and told our legislators to not do those things? And then if they did, we would change who the legislator is and put somebody else in there that we have questioned to say, can you not do those things? We have the power to change these things at the legislative level. Am I wrong in that uh, assessment? You're absolutely correct. But the okay. public opinion... Just, the pub, a lot the, of people don't agree opinion, with that their votes matter. The public opinion is, is going to be in favor of what they were doing. And yeah. uh, uh, the, the, the magic is to change public opinion. And that's not, that's not going to be an easy task because it's been... It's kind of like a lot of the myths that people begin to believe. They've, they've been out there for so long that people accept them as being true. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I was listening to a podcast and it was a very pro criminal justice reform uh, episode that they had done. And they came to the uh, the issue of rapists and they said that they are likely to get out of prison and immediately go find someone to rape. And I was like, I don't think that's how it works. A, for rape, you're going to be there for a really long time, most likely. And they're going to be heavily, heavily watching those individuals when they do get out i i just didn't see it like their recidivism rate is going to be super high you know a drug person is going to end up with a pretty high recidivism rate compared to almost any of quote unquote our people it seems vanishingly small it is by every measurement that's been done the and with within a particular type of category though the recidivism is a lot higher the non-contact offenses tend to be higher recidivists Okay. That that that's just the given, but but the uh, the contact offenses, unless it's a serial uh, individual, mm-hmm. the, the recidivism like an actual be- damaged medically treatable, like a person that needs counseling, like in somebody that just makes a mistake kind of person, the urinating in public, which probably doesn't exist, whatever. But that kind of person doesn't need counseling and has a has a very low recidivism rate. That is correct, and and the, those those impulse control ones are are worth what you're talking about where people make an impulsive decision. People have all sorts of in- impulse control issues. People are compel- uh, compulsive shoppers, and they bankrupt their families. Right. They're, com- they're compulsive gamblers, and they bankrupt their families. 
and and I'm not equating the the significance of the two, but I'm saying impulse issues. Uh, 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 you could have a sleepover of a of a niece or a nephew uh, uh, that that has developed physically, and you could have had a drink or two, and mm-hmm. you could put your hands where you shouldn't because of a lack of impulse control, and after the system has done the harsh things they've done to you, you're never going to do that again. I gotcha. And uh, one more after this one says, um, this is a question for Larry. This came over from discord. It says Larry lives in Albuquerque, right? Has he ever talked about the pretty good sized cop watch movement that goes on there? There are at least three groups that frequently post videos to YouTube of police interactions. I gather that uh, I gather they use police scanners to find the locations and then record from a respectful distance. The Albuquerque Police Department seems to mostly leave them alone now. Seems like a great constitutional way to keep the police accountable. I wonder if Larry knows or has any thoughts about it. Might be an interesting topic for the podcast. Well, it might be, except I don't know anything about it. I know that the, that the police, due to litigation uh, through, the, through the years and through uh, the federal consent decree that we're under right now, that they have improved a lot of their protocols in terms of citizen oversight and, and uh, I, I, but as far as the organized groups I didn't know anything about that so this person has enlightened me to something that I'm not aware of if we can sort of pull back though what would what would what is your opinion in general of all of the cell phones all the cameras that everyone has running around that they capture the George Floyd events and so many other things uh, do you think that's positive or is that less is that a, a negative for the community and or the police well, I think it's a positive for, for both the community and the police because I, I believe that the police, by and large, want to do a good job. Uh, I have that I have those rose-colored glasses that they want to do a good job, and I believe that there's systemic problems within the police bureaucracy that cause – I mean, watch the movie Serpico. I believe that was recorded in 1971 uh, or 70, sometime in the, you know, 50 years ago. And I don't think a whole lot's changed since Serpico. I really don't. And and uh, so, so I think that the the uh, the the cameras everywhere give us insight into what we would never have known because of the blue wall of silence, where where it's just the code of conduct that that most officers uh, uh, remain silent. Well, the the videos speak volumes about what they're being silent about, and oftentimes they they taint their reports with 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 narratives that just don't match what actually happened. And, and we get a, a, a better accounting by the by the videos. The good police officers should be happy that these recordings are happening because that prevents them from being put in the position where they have to rat on one of their colleagues. The ratting is done by the camera. Okay, I see what you're saying there. That makes sense. Yeah, they don't they don't have to be trapped up in some sort of being the snitch inside the organization. They can just let the public speak for it and. And so forth. Okay. So, so I think it's a good thing, and I think that there's a lot of good police officers that 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 are that are happy that it's happening, and and I think there's some not so good police officers that that try to confiscate confiscate uh, video equipment and phones, and and they do that and say we're seizing this for evidence, but but uh, unfortunately, that's going to happen. I mean, they're they're still they're still bad cops out there. They're only human beings. That's all. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, well, uh, we can uh, do this a little quick. Uh, somebody wrote in that listened to the podcast. This came back fast, Larry. This is only from episode 149 where we discussed getting the podcast into the prison system. And uh, just, you know, further further talking about that, th- this individual is, ask- is referencing that he gets religious kind of podcast from a Jewish organization, uh, an Orthodox Jewish organization that he is uh, is working with. And he provides me provides us with some resources, and I assure you, I will check into them. Uh, but what I found from uh, just a, a very intensive, like thirty second Google search, was that it was going to cost us money to get our our product distributed into it, and not cheaply either. But uh, I will certainly try to try to figure out how to get them published in. That would be super fun if we could get them actually published inside the prison. Oh, it, it would be. A, don't you think the prison administrators would be really fond of this program? I have a feeling that, but I have a feeling that they would object to it. But at the same time, if we did have that five hundred one c three, which I know will work on either at the beginning of the year or after uh, the election coming up, but uh, I, I imagine that that would help us. 
So, well, you know, there there actually would be uh, prisons that would object, but if if they actually sit down and listen to what we say, I think a lot of prison administrators would be very happy with us because we try to call it down the middle. Yeah, yeah. I, I have I have no hesitancy to criticize prisoners. I've done it over and over again about their internal code of conduct, about how they classify inmates themselves, and to to, to who's the sleaze balls, and 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 in terms about how they're willing to jettison their own due process. They don't want you to. They don't want to administer. They fight for their due process, but. They don't afford anything to anybody else. They have their own administration of justice. It doesn't. I mean, I I think the prison administration would really like us because I I give them credit for the hard work they do running running a prison. It's not an easy job. It is not. I, I, but I, I'm I'm thinking back to the Mississippi. I think it was Parchman is the prison that the riots broke out six ish months ago. Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, like you, you, no one could do anything but go. Those are deplorable conditions. I can't imagine everyone going, well, that's what they does. I mean, I guess people were saying that's what they deserve, but you know, they're in there like animals. That's why they're in there. That's probably a common sentiment that people had, but they shouldn't have been treated that way in the first place. I don't know that anybody would uh, really uh, object to how that they are being treated incredibly harshly. Well, and, but again, sometimes the prison administrators are stuck with that, not about their own choosing. You have prison administrators who want to do. They understand correctional association ACA standards. They understand. They understand how a prison should be run in terms of classification and not running a snitch system. They understand all that, but they're not given the resources. When when they go to their right. legislature, legislature asking for resources about employee compensation, which is usually de- deplorable in most states, particularly in the South, and when they ask for funding. They're the lowest on the totem pole. So you have good administrators who are stuck with old, ancient facilities that are underfunded, and they are tasked with doing the best they can with what they have. And then you have horrible prison administrators who are are like former Sheriff Joe R. Pyle, who are excited to see how much misery they can inflict on people. Now, that's the type of prison administrator that would not like me, because I would call that administrator out and say, you could do a whole lot better with the resources you have. But sometimes, like in these southern states, Alabama doesn't allocate very much for prisons, and they lock up too many people. And, and, and those people are stuck in a very bad situation trying to make the best of what they have. And I will also say, Brian, thank you for writing to me directly. And also, thank you for having incredibly legible handwriting. Oh, that was a fantastic letter. Yes, it was. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registrymatters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. I, I think, Larry, that leads us to this uh, this uh, final little tidbit on this uh, Georgia thing, doesn't it? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to spend some time talking about an important case. Well, I think things started, uh, if we uh, do a little bit of history, uh, the way that you wrote it up, it says, on September 24th, a lawsuit was filed in the United States District Court of the Middle District of Georgia, challenging the Butts County Sheriff's Office practice of placing warning signs at the residence of PFRs before Hallow's Eve. And then we went to court. I, I was in the courtroom with uh, another person from Georgia, and the, the, uh, the judge like gave us the injunction. Now, I guess, yeah, that was just this last year. And that was an incredibly great victory that we had at that time that, that shut down that whole process. What transpired from there? Well, what transpired from there is the injunction for people who may be joining us for the first time. An injunction is an order granting you relief that you have not won uh, because the case has not been tried. On, on the merits underlying your complaint. You're asking for relief in advance of your case being adjudicated. 
And the standards are incredibly high to get an injunction. It's not anything to do with whether the, the judge likes you or dislikes you. It has to do with the, the, the four-pronged test, which the two most important ones. Are, are you likely to succeed on the merits when the case goes to trial? And will you suffer irreparable harm if the injunction relief that you're requesting hasn't, isn't granted? And those, those critical factors, those two, determine whether you're going to get injunctive relief or not. And in this particular case, the judge felt like that the evidence was there, that the likelihood for success on the merits were good, and that uh, that the harm would be any, – any First Amendment depri- deprivation or infringement would be irreparable harm, so he granted injunctive relief. And then that put – that put the kibosh on it for those plaintiffs. It was not. It was actually not a, a class action. It was only for for the plaintiffs that were named, and the the court encouraged them not to do the signs uh, uh, in general, and they didn't. But but the injunction was really directly applied to the to the plaintiffs, and and then the case had to had to move forward towards a trial, whether there was going to be a full blown trial or whether the case was going to be resolved by an agreement between the parties, or whether there was going to be. Uh, a, a decision made without a trial through a process called summary judgment. And this case was decided in, in that uh, last process that I mentioned by, by summary judgment. Did, uh, did the sheriff say anything? Did he perform any actions that really were like, like kind of egregious? I, I think there was things in the, what I'm actually getting at is that I think there were things in the case that were brought up that there was no in tent to put these things out there to highlight pfrs but there was stuff found on his facebook page from the previous year of like i'm gonna like single these people out something like that so well i'm not sure i follow that that question uh the 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 intent becomes to where the whether you have uh whether you have a um when you when you're litigating for damages under 1983 and you're you're uh, which is a section of the United States Code uh, civil rights you have to be able to show that 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 there was a, a right clearly established and that there's an there's a willful intent to violate that right and and if you're getting at that part the 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 sheriff's department was claiming that they didn't intend to intrude on private property that they thought they were that they were on the public right of way is that where you're going um, no, I'm actually referring to because he was posting on his Facebook page just about that his whole intent behind this was to, I, I don't want to say that he, I don't, he didn't use the word shame them, but the intent was to, you know, highlight and, and show everyone where these people were. That was, that was the intent, but he didn't bring that forth as being quote unquote his intent. He was just trying to, just trying to keep the community safe, your honor. Well, but I do, the, I, uh, I do remember, I do remember that he he he, he said he was uh, he was uh, simply trying to uh, do his duty. He put his hand on the Bible, and he said that he felt he had a duty to notify the citizens of the presence of these people, and that he was doing that. That was his intent, nothing more. But the the post that he put on Facebook the year prior to is is what they, I think kind of got him in trouble. Is that there was that from the previous year, and that's what he was trying to do. And then everyone's like, "Oh, thank you, Sheriff, for keeping the people safe." Did they say it? Did they say it like that? In Butts County, they would definitely say it that way. <laughs> definitely, they would say it that way. Where, where is, where uh, is But, where is Butts County for our global audience? If you were to, if you were to look at Georgia, where would you find Butts County? If you were to find a place between Macon and Atlanta, it would be pretty much halfway between. There's the uh, the diagnostic center for the Georgia Department of Corrections. It's called Jackson State Prison, and it's right in that general vicinity. It's it's. Yeah, it's it's probably just a hair south of the middle point between Macon and Atlanta. Mm-hmm. It's pretty much Nowhereville, though. So yeah, it's 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 a it's still a small county. I think somewhere around twenty twenty five thousand people. Um. Uh, uh. And and what was uh, Mr. Long's? What was Sheriff Long's attitude about where this was going to go? If even if we won at the next level after that. Uh, you know, since the summary judgment, but you know, he lost the injunction. If he had lost the case, what was his next step? What did he want to do next? Well, he did. In fact, he filed an appeal on the uh, on the injunctive relief, and uh, that was that is pending, uh, set for oral arguments in the Eleventh Circuit, which is in Atlanta, for mid December, I think, fifteenth or sixteenth. And uh, he had he had he had taken that up on appeal. Uh, injunctive relief is immediately appealable. 
uh, because again, you're getting relief that you have a one. And and he he's he filed an appeal, and the appeal has yet to be decided. We argued that the appeal was moot. Our team argued that the appeal was moot because the injunction was only good through Halloween 2019. Therefore, the court should not consider the appeal. Now, our posture may change, and the, you know, and I'm not prepared, and nor am I in the in the total know of what to what they might do next. But one of the things you would do next would be that since the case has been resolved on the merits, you would you would consider trying to get the court to take this consolidate the uh, the injunction appeal with the appeal of the merits and go ahead and have their oral arguments if you're ready on the whole case. But the more likelihood is they'll probably cancel that hearing because now that the case has been dissolved, been resolved on the merits, uh, there's no need for the for the injunction here because the injunction is going to be lifted by the district judge who issued it. If 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 he if if it's not clear that that it dissolved itself because it was only for 2019, if an order is requested, the judge is going to issue that order because he's found against us and in favor of the county. And and just forgive me for a minute, going back a couple questions from the listener saying that we're all negative Nancy's all the time, that here is a direct example that we shot them down and got the injunction. The sheriff should have been like, whoa, okay, sorry, you guys are right, man. We're just going to back off. But that's not what he did. Granted, the Spalding sheriff did. And then we also sent a letter down. I don't remember the name of the county uh, down like in Mosquitoville of uh, South Georgia. We sent a uh, like notice citing the injunction and they backed off. So So I'm, I'm just using that as evidence to say they may not just back down when you say, hey, you can't do this. Uh, they're they're not likely to just back down. What people fail to realize is that the governmental entities have virtually an unlimited bank account. And there are a lot of attorneys out there that love to make money. Therefore, they have no difficulty finding attorneys to represent them, none whatsoever, because they're going to get paid, generally at an hourly rate that's very attractive, and they're happy to run up billable hours. So they will invent arguments they will invent stuff that you can never imagine, which if people want to bother to read this decision, they did some of that. But they will invent arguments to litigate, and they are going to do that. It doesn't matter if it's in the pristine, pure state of Maryland where they're wind-driven, or if it's in Arkansas, whether it's in New Mexico, whether it's in Georgia, doesn't matter. Michigan, that's what they're going to do. And if you are in denial that they're going to do that, then I can't help you. But that's what they're going to do. They have unlimited resources, and they're going to fight anytime you're challenging constitutionality of anything. That's a law. Now, this wasn't even a law. This was an, it, it was an action initiated without the benefit of law, and they still fought it. So it's a lot of wishful thinking to think these people are just going to go away. We have a series of prepared questions, so I'm going to, uh, between you and I, we, we created a, a dozen or so questions, so uh, just to try and keep things on track instead of us meandering about. Uh, why was this lawsuit filed, and why do you people at Narsal not challenge the registry itself? If you get rid of the registry, this issue people have wasted so much time on will cease to exist, Larry. Why do you people not just challenge the registry itself? Well, that has been done multiple times, uh, it, and, and uh, it's the, with limited success because registries may not be unconstitutional, and it depends on the registry. And in fact, Georgia's registry has been challenged, and, and, and they haven't made any dramatic changes to Georgia's registry in a decade since the last since the federal case that was handled by Judge, uh, uh, I believe his name is Clarence Cooper. Uh, but but that, so the, the, I mean, are, are you oblivious to what's happening in the world with case decisions? We just got the decision out of the Tenth Circuit where where it was vacated. Uh, Judge Judge Mache was overturned by by the Tenth Circuit. So if, if you want to yeah. if you want to continue to believe that the mere act of having registries is un, unconstitutional, you can do that, but. It's not realistic. So the question is, why did Narsal challenge the, the Halloween thing? We felt that, I can speak for Narsal, we felt that if you've got 159 counties in Georgia and you allow sheriffs to invent requirements, this only happens once a year. But they can invent any requirements that's not in the statute and impose those requirements 
by their own initiative and then threaten to prosecute you if you don't comply. And we felt and still feel that we cannot allow law enforcement to invent requirements. We take that oath seriously when they put their hand on the Bible that they're going to enforce the law and not make the law. And that's why we attacked this. We felt felt that this was a clear infringement on a person's property rights, and it was compelling them to speak a message. And, and it was important enough to try to stop it in its tracks. So that's why, that's why we attacked this. And, and without going down that whole rabbit trail of registries being constitutional, you have described what, you, at least from your point of view, will be like some sort of constitutional registry where maybe you have an app and you take a picture from your phone. There's your updated photo if that's what is necessary. But all of the, the restrictions, the term that you introduced me to is the disabilities and restraints, the living restrictions, the, all of the other presence restrictions, all that stuff. That's what makes this so horrible. That's correct. But each registry, each state, and even within the state, there's individual local restrictions that are imposed. And each registry scheme has to be challenged on whether it can withstand constitutional scrutiny. The mere act of registering someone is not unconstitutional. What are the three claims that they, uh, what were the three claims and can we go through them? Yes, we can. They, the, the, the defendants, the plaintiffs allege that the, the defendants being the sheriff compels speech in violation of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, that they, the defendants, uh, trespassed in violation of state law, and they committed an unlawful taking of the plaintiff's property in violation of the Fifth Amendment. And those were the three claims that they put forward. Uh, didn't get a lot of traction on either of the three. Um, but they did award it to for one situation and not for the other two, I think is how we can say that. Ex- explain that. Uh, they they awarded it to the person that doesn't own the house. He doesn't have like the property interest. He lives with his parents, but well, not the ones that either own or rent their home. Well, it's it, it, it's it's the opposite. The people who who did not have uh, the, the there there was there was lack of standing on 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 the people who didn't own property. You can't take from a person what they don't own, and at, at the very right. minimum, at, at the very minimum, they had to have a, a lease and. The people just living with their parents apparently just did, didn't have a lease, so so they they didn't really have any property rights, as far as the court could see. Yeah. Okay. And if we move on, then it says this case was decided on motions for summary judgment. What in the flippity flip is summary judgment? Well, it's an expedited process when when you when you seek summary judgment. Either party can move the defending party or the or the or the plaintiff. Either party can move for summary judgment. And when you when you make the motion, actually, I wrote an article for the for the Roush decision out of Tennessee, and we put it in our newsletter. And 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 I I cut and pasted it in here. I'm, I'm going to use it again. And the court itself explained the standard, but actually, I liked mine better. I liked what I'd cut from the Does versus Roush with with my uh, with my little add-ons in it. But summary judgment is, is, is a way to resolve a case without going to trial if there are no facts in dispute. And that's the key. There, the moving party is telling the court, we don't need to go to trial here. All the facts are clear. The parties are in agreement. Therefore, just decide the law. Decide the case based on the law. Save us a bunch of time and money. And we'll get this case over with. Was the decision um, to request summary judgment wise in this case? Well, being that I don't have a law license, I'll have to let the decision speak for itself. So in the summation that I've written, I've quoted from the court where the court said unequivocally that there were, uh, there were facts that were in dispute. And, and and I highlighted that. It says, but the critical issue is, in fact, hotly dispute hotly disputed about whether the the, the signs were on right of way or whether they were on private property. And that is not me saying that. I got it straight from the from the decision of the court. 
that Can that we that dig was... into that for just a minute? Sure. What is the right? I mean, like I, to me, I think of you know, I, I'm responsible to cut my grass all the way to the street. I don't cut it all the way to five feet, six, whatever this is, some imaginary number is. However, there is a ditch, I guess, uh, like you know, like a water runoff and an exposed drain. I guess you could call it. Am I not responsible to care for this part of the property because that's probably the city's? Well, generally, you are required to care for that property. But the question is, can 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 you, as a private owner, do what can you do with that other than 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 mowing the grass? Because you you're not allowed to to do certain things on on easement and on right of way, but but the government can. I mean, your speed limit signs are generally off to the side. You know, your your any type of warning signage. I mean, utility easements. They run they. They use, what, what, what happened in this case is that there wasn't sufficient factual development about what constituted pr- private property and where these signs were being placed and whether they were being placed on right of way that, that the, that the, that the uh, uh, occupant and homeowner uh, had no say so over or whether they were being placed on their private property. That, in hindsight, should have been developed at trial. There should have been experts that talked about what the Georgia law is, and it may be individual county ordinances. I don't know all these things, but that's what you have a trial for, to bring in experts to, to talk about these things. And experts cost money. And it also would have delayed this, this case by another year, which would have meant the, 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 the team that we have, they were faced with Halloween bearing down on us with no injunction because the injunction from 2019 had expired. And we were arguing that it had expired to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals saying that there's no need for you to even hear this case because the injunction has expired. Therefore, they were going to have to, they were going to have to request another injunction and go through that process, or could they go ahead and try to resolve the case on the merits in advance of Halloween 2020? And in hindsight, we can see that the decision wasn't favorable, but their analysis was that they thought they had it won. And you know, here we are sitting here quarterbacking on Monday. <laughs> I'm actually looking at the next question and wondering, going, going back to the previous listener or a couple of questions ago from the listener about, um, won't they just lay down? Couldn't we apply that to us? Hey, like we've lost decisions. Should we just lay down and stop trying? Absolutely not. Uh, I do not know uh, what we will do, but I do know that, that Narsal has invested a, a significant amount of money, not, a, not gobs and gobs, but a significant amount of money. And we were committed to this case, and we believe in this case. So therefore, we're not likely just to go away and say that's the end of it. Uh, uh, what we're going to do next? This just came out three days ago, so we don't know. Can can you, you like literally, Larry? Some someone told me like you are the best legal strategist, legal mind that that we know. And yes, I'm sorry to say, Larry, that you don't have all the fancy letters and Esquire and all that. You know, you didn't go to school for a hundred years. I don't really care. The reason why our listeners are here. And the reason why I chose you for this podcast was because of your expertise and your strategy and your insight and all that. So now that I'm done blowing smoke up your fanny, what do you see as the options to go next? Well, the the great thing is even on summary judgment, there's a right to an appeal. Uh, Just because it was decided without a trial doesn't mean that there's no appellate review. So you, you would, you would be arguing, and this is, this is a great question, actually. This this would get us back to Doe versus uh, uh, Smith versus Doe. The then, the facts that Alaska, the parties right? yeah the facts that the parties agreed to on summary judgment cannot change on appeal. Those are the facts. Whether they're facts or not doesn't matter. Those were the facts, and the appellate court will not disturb those facts because that's what the parties agreed that they were. So, in anything that wasn't established as, as a fact is resolved in favor of the non-moving party on summary judgment. So, so anything, if, 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 the, if the county says our defense would have shown this had we gone to trial, the appellate court has to accept that as being a fact because they didn't ever get an opportunity because we requested they not be afforded the opportunity to put on their defense. So, so we're, we're limited in what, can, go, go, what can, can be considered on appeal because the facts were established by the parties. And but that doesn't mean that the law was interpreted correctly. You know, there, there's cases cited all throughout the, the 28-page opinion, and those cases may be in, applied incorrectly. I don't begin to think that I know. I just prepared 
for the, for the podcast today and did the best I could to, to put something together. Yeah. But but what what I would say is there there's an appeal option. There's certainly the request for reconsideration before you before you go up on appeal. Then there's a notice of appeal to Eleventh Circuit. There's already an appeal pending. And and like I say, it could be extinguished, but there could be the possibility of, of combining these the, these these issues now on on, a, on on appeal with the with the Eleventh Circuit. But but in in terms of that, the the team's going to have to huddle. The, you know, the, the attorneys there. There's uh, uh, two attorneys in Georgia. Janice Bellucci is working on this case with us. Yeah, I'm working on this case to the extent that anybody listens to me, and we we've got to figure out what we can do. And and I don't know all the things we'll we'll do, but I know this: we're not going to just go away. Is it possible that our cause has suffered a setback due to this decision? There is absolutely no doubt that as of this moment, we have suffered a temporary setback. It may become a permanent setback if we if we lose on appeal, but clearly at this point, there is adver there will be adverse ramifications. There was the settlement negotiations at Spalding County; those would be potentially adversely affected because Spalding County is in the northern district of Georgia. This case is in the central middle district of Georgia, but it doesn't change the fact that the two counties border each other and the, and the county attorneys representing the two counties, I can assure you, are talking to each other. They're aware of this. And Spalding County is going to say, gee, I don't know why we should stipulate to a permanent injunction and pay these people money when, when, when the judge ruled against them. So that would put that settlement in jeopardy. The Georgia Sheriff's Association clearly has been informed and apprised of this decision. And they have probably already communicated to the to the sheriffs all over the, uh, Georgia that that this is a uh, this is a green light to go. Now it was such short notice before uh, before Halloween. I don't know if their machinations being with COVID nineteen if they actually could act on it for this year, but it certainly could impact us for next year. It, we all all of a sudden could rather than having butts and spawning, we could have we could have dozens or maybe a, a, a hundred counties in Georgia doing this. It, so it it's it, it's it's potentially devastating to us. Which begs the question, it's not on the list. Why did you people litigate if you could make things worse? <laughs> I mean, why didn't you just go home and forget the uh, whole thing? We have that question come up all the just, time. <laughs> just let the two counties, whatever, have to deal with it. And at least the other 157 counties didn't have to deal with it. Well, that, that's, that's exactly what we've got a person in Clayton County that insists that. that, that, that and, and Clayton County is very close to, the, the, to these counties. That we don't have it so bad here in Clayton County. And and with you people making all this noise, first thing you know, we're going to have problems here in Clayton County. And you by people. that standard, by that standard, we should just never litigate anything. We should just turn a right. blind eye and say, well, it isn't so bad. It's only it's only two counties right now. Of course, we had no assurance because we, we learned in discovery that that the Sheriff's Association was encouraging these signs, producing these signs. And uh, uh, they, they were uh, opining to the sheriffs that this was legal. So what we what we knew was that it was it had been encouraged by the sheriff's association. So just because only two were, were doing it at the time doesn't mean that that was all it was going to all ever be. But now I'm I'm afraid that there's going to be a rapid explosion of this because now they've got a green light. I mean the court has said it's okay. Can you can we walk down the path of compelled speech in regards to having a sign posted in your yard? A sign the sign didn't say sex offender pfr didn't use any of that uh language it just said don't get candy here like it actually I mean, we've we've got it here in the in the in the uh, analysis no trick-or-treat mm -hmm. at this yep. address a community safety message from butts county sheriff gary law and it has stopped two right. stop signs and a warning the warning is the most problematic warning why why is there a warning on what basis but that that that's all the signs said it didn't say the person's on the registry right so, so how is this so problematic? They're not calling the person out. I'm, I'm, I'm like, if we compared it to the driver's license that actually says, "Hey, you're a PFR," it, it, it's not the little innocuous thing in the corner that has some little code. This, I'm not saying that. I man, I certainly am not sitting here trying to say I agree with it. I'm just trying to be devil's advocate for just a minute. This doesn't say anything other than, "Don't knock at this door." Oh, well, that's so true. How is this compelled speech, uh, government message? Like, where do we cross the lines? That's the struggle that the court had in terms of, the, of this case, because the government speaks all the time on documents. We've talked about the the corrective lenses. Uh, every state 
Mark's corrective lenses on people who can only pass the eye test with corrective lenses. That's not intended to shame you. It's not intended to do anything bad. It's intended to keep the public safe. If you require corrective lenses to operate a vehicle safely and an officer encounters you, that is the most innocuous way that I can think of to this very day to convey that information to the officer that if you're not wearing your corrective lenses, you're not safe to be on the road. That's all that's for. So that's government. That's the government speaking to the, to the, to the, to the cop. And this, this changes slightly in, in my view because it is the government speaking to the passersby, but they're speaking on private, from the platform of private property and they're, they're speaking on a day that you, that expression is accepted that you can express yourself. And they're saying that you cannot interact with anybody that chooses to interact with you by this no trick-or-treating here. And it didn't say that you couldn't decorate, but per, I'm presuming that if the, the deputies brought the signs by and told you you can't uh, hand out candy, they also told you don't bother to decorate your house because that would encourage you people to want to come. Yeah, well, I'm assuming I don't know if that it's, they did uh, for it. anybody on the registry or if it's just uh, if it's just supervision. But I'm, I'm I'm making that assumption without any evidence. But mm-hmm. but but I'm assuming mm-hmm. they did that. So you're getting a, you're getting into you're getting into some really significant areas of speech and expression that you're that you're disallowing. But then again, let's take it to 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 the cigarettes uh, where 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 we have compelled speech because Sheriff Long says that clearly that his argument was that the government is speaking and no rational person would associate that this would be a message that the offender endorses. Therefore, we can do it. Clearly, it's a government message. Well, is it possible he's right? When you, since 1964, when you've bought a pack of cigarettes, there's been a variation of some form of warning. The, the first one started out with warning. The surgeon, the surgeon, I believe it said, warning, cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health. And then in about 1970 or 71, they added, they, they came up with like a rotating message of, of, of like three or four different messages that said, warning, the Surgeon General has determined this. Do you think that the tobacco companies want that message on there? Do you think they endorse that? But it, isn't it the government commandeering their, their, their rapper and, and forcing them to carry a message that they vehemently disagree with? How is it the government gets away with that? And not only that, making them pay to put the uh, message on there too. And 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 I'll take you one further. The government in, in the early seventies banned advertising on television. When's the last time you've right. seen a TV ad? Oh, 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 uh, is, isn't 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 that prohibition on First Amendment rights? I, I guess if you think that corporations are people too. Well, the Supreme Court said they are. I, know. I mean, we, we don't we don't execute very many corporations, but the Supreme Court said they are people. <laughs> um, uh, so you wrote, in addition, most of the assertions raised in the complaint were dismissed with prejudice, meaning they cannot be raised again. Can you elaborate? Is this something similar to double jeopardy? Yes, it's similar to double jeopardy. You, 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 you don't get multiple bites at the apple when 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 you raise claims that have been extinguished through through a litigative process. So these people can't come back and raise these claims again. They had their chance. They had their day in court. They chose summary judgment. They're out of business now. Now, this is not a precedential decision. So it doesn't mean that new plaintiffs can't come raise these same issues, but it means these people, these claims are over. If they don't like these signs being erected, they need to vacate Butts County because they're done by and large, except for the one remaining claim which I didn't completely understand, but there was one that was not fully extinguished by the court. And let's go back to the decision because it was at the very end of, 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 the, uh, of the order. And did I put it in my analysis? I think I did, didn't I? There was, yes, well, there's, you did. There's one, okay, what is the surviving claim? Um, I thought the surviving claim was about the people that are living with their folks. I thought that was the surviving claim. Uh, the ones that don't, you know, somebody that owns or rents their property, that they are the ones that are doomed and the ones that live with mom and dad, that they're, they're not on the lease okay. that they okay, are, well, the, the ones that, that survive. I know the section that says there's their hope. Yes, there is hope because the court was not able to resolve all issues, particularly the issue of whether the signs were on public right of way or private property. Quoting from the order, the court first makes clear that what it, it is not concluded, concluding. 
The sheriff's office believes it has the right to post the signs in front of the plaintiff's homes as long as the signs are, are in, in a... I can't... You, you're a better reader than I am. Read that. That's fine. So Sorry, the, but the, the, court, the sheriff's... Yeah, the sheriff's office believes it has the right to post signs in front of the plaintiff's home as long as the signs are in yet-to-be-defined rights-of-way and that it can prosecute anyone who moves the signs. The court doesn't reach that issue, but as noted, the defendants have scant authority to support either proposition. And the, score, and the court certainly doesn't conclude, given the facts here, that putting the sign in the plaintiff's yards makes sense. Rather, the court only concludes that, for the most part, the relief the plaintiffs seek is not available. And that came from page 28 of the opinion. So the, the summary judgment precluded the court from being able to determine whether this is right of way or not. So that issue remains open. Any, any of the plaintiffs can bring that back again. But everything else is gone. They didn't trespass, and they didn't do a taking, and they do have qualified immunity because this was not a clearly, the, this, the, the standard is that this has to be a, 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 something that's clearly established, these violations, alleged violations, and there's nothing clearly established on this. So therefore, they have qualified immunity. But but the remaining issue for these individuals is whether or not this is private property or government right away. And the court seems to be telegraphing that they have scant authority so far for their assertion that this is uh, right of way. Didn't Janice Bellucci file a case, win a case similar to this in California, or is this a fig newton in my imagination? I think there was a case some years ago in Simi Valley. I don't remember the particulars, but I do remember that uh, that she, being on the team, that she had uh, had. had offered us that pleading, and, uh, and I remember right. something along that line. Uh, th then there is something to be said for 50 individual little countries. You were just saying a few minutes ago about we have to fight each registry on its own home turf in each little state and all that stuff. So this goes to that as well, that she may have won a, a case out there, whatever the, the reasoning behind it was, and we fought a case here, different reasoning and different outcomes necessarily. That is correct, and and none, nothing that happened in California is binding in any way in Georgia. But cookie cutter, copy paste. If it applies, then you, some of the work has been done for you already. Correct, and it, it, you you cite to it as persuasive authority, you, you, which which this court cited to the cases uh, they cited to the recent decision out of Louisiana. In fact, uh, when trying to analyze whether this was compelled speech, and, and, oh. and the, the, they oh, cited, how ironic. So the, the, the thing that we just talked about last week, it yes. was cited in this case. <laughs> it was. It was cited by the court. And they said they received The judge said he received an email about it. And, and he, cited, kind of he, funny. he cited to the Marshall case out of Alabama in terms of the driver's license. But this compel speech is really tricky. And, and I don't pretend to understand it completely. This is, this is, this is a, a, a nuance of, of law in terms of what, what, where the where – the, this is compelled speech or not, or whether this is government speech. And this certainly, the right of way is unclear to the, to the court in terms of whether that was the right of way or whether it was private property. And what really wasn't raised in the complaint very succinctly was that, that uh, uh, the registry has its requirements and a sheriff can't really invent requirements beyond what's in the statute because there, therefore you get into void for vagueness. You don't know what you're required to do and you can have a law enforcement officer just because they have a badge tell you you have to do this because you're on the registry. No, it has to be in the statute. I think if I had anything to second guess myself about, I would have been more assertive about we have to figure out some way to have the claim in there that uh, that allowing the county to invent their own requirements makes the, the statute vague and void because no one knows what they have to do. And we're getting ready to gear up again for Cobb County because the Cobb County is doing that very same thing. They're inventing requirements that are not in the statute, not in terms of Halloween science, but in terms of several other things that they're requiring. And they're arresting people for not doing those things. One of them is if you don't call them within 24 hours of, of them leaving a flyer, they, they, they believe that that's contemptuous of their authority. And they're locking people up and saying that they don't live there. If you don't call them back, they, they leave a few flyers. And then if, you're not, if you don't respond, they, they conclude that you're no longer there. And, and I'm, I'm going to be, like, I don't know the right terms for this. You have described to me that there are certain areas of authority that different echelons have. I don't know if that's the right word to use. But the sheriff of the county is not 
something that's listed in the in the statute as being an entity. I, I hope I got you close enough that you can fill in the gaps. Well, that was in terms of the Cobb County attorney's response to Narsal. Right. She said that that in terms of the more frequent verification requirements, that these were imposed by Cobb County. And then she she cited to the Adam Walsh Act that said that, that, in, that in the Adam Walsh Act, the language says that jurisdictions are allowed to exceed the requirements. And she's absolutely correct. Jurisdictions are allowed to go through the legislative process and they can have requirements for registrants that are not recommended by the federal government to be substantially AWA compliant. But where her analysis broke down is that the Cobb County Sheriff's Office is not a jurisdiction. A jurisdiction is defined under Adam Walsh as being a state or a territory. So, so, so we pointed out to her that, that you're headed down the right path. The jurisdictions are allowed to do that, but they have to enact it through the statutory process. And you can't, I mean, when you put your hand on that Bible, when you run for sheriff, you <laughs> promise that you would enforce the law. If you want to be a lawmaker, Sheriff Long, run for the Georgia General Assembly and you can be a lawmaker. But right now, your job is simply to follow what's in that book. And there's nothing in the book that requires anybody to have signage. And so a, a state or a territory would be Georgia or Puerto Rico. Those are the two entities that you just described. Yes. And Georgia could conceivably put this in their statutory scheme that you're required to do this. Now, it's not recommended by the Adam Walsh Act. It would not get you closer to AWA compliance if you were in, 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 uh, in deficiency uh, in some category. This wouldn't do anything because they don't care about Halloween restrictions. This would just make your citizens feel good, but this would not move you to, uh, toward compliance. But you could do that. You can do things that are not recommended, and many states do, and that's where people misinterpret the Adam Walsh Act. I want you to do a program about the Adam Walsh Act one of these days because it, I get emails almost every week about it, and and people so misunderstand the Adam Walsh Act, and they, they gripe about things that are not in the Adam Walsh Act. And I say, well, you gripe all you want to, but it's not there. And I think uh, out of all the other questions, I think this is really the last one. It says both parties moved for summary judgment. This is something that I'm really trying hard to understand because this seems to be like the nuance of this whole thing is, did they move for the same summary judgment, both parties, or did they do this independently? Do they agree to a summary judgment? Okay. No. They, so they did one guy said they want this. The other guy said they want that. Correct. They, the the and chair says both we're entitled, entitled to into? summary judgment. Uh, well, the, each motion for summary judgment gets co- uh, considered independent of the other. So the court determines if if the plaintiff is entitled to summary judgment and rules on that motion, then they determine if if the uh, if the defendant is entitled to summary judgment. But but you could do a joint, conceivably do a joint motion for summary judgment. But but in this case, the sheriff had his reasons for wanting summary judgment, and we had our reasons for wanting su- summary judgment. And the the sheriff had more compelling reasons than we did, so he won. Okay, and and you're just saying, as in, like, here is here are, here's my list. So then the judge says, okay, you guys win because you you submitted a better document, like copying and pasting. Well, no, the the law favors his interpretation of the law was that the case law supported the county's position. Okay. That 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 based on what we argued, we were less compelling, and all the 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 the, the inferences were resolved in favor of the non-moving party on our motion because anything that 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 was not proven they the 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 court has to interpret in the light most favorable to the to the non-moving party on the, on a motion for summary judgment so so everything went in favor of the county on our motion and everything went in favor of us on the county's motion is it um do they I guess they don't combine then. So then he just, the, the judge looks at it and I keep saying he, cause this, in this case, I don't mean to be like, you know, all, all judges are only guys. Uh, he, he looks at it and weighs which one he feels is better. Like that's just the end of it. The guy with the robe, end of story. Well, until there's an appeal, this okay. is as if there had been a trial. This okay. is if 40, 42 witnesses have testified and the, the both parties, both sides have rested. And, and, and the judge made a decision. He made the decision on pleadings, and and the rules established for summary judgment are that the non-moving party gets the benefit of the doubt on, on anything that's adverse to them because they weren't able to defend that by the benefit of a trial. Back to the Smith versus Doe, Alaska said that we want this scheme because the recidivism is high. Since there was no trial. And that was not able to be unpacked 
and the court below, the Supreme Court was bound to accept that because that was a defense that would have been tested had there been a trial. So they don't try the cases at the Supreme Court. And, and everybody does understand that the, the appellate court is right. not going to try the case. And just one other point with this. If, if our side had said, we don't want summary judgment, does that negate the other side? If either side says they don't want summary judgment, does that mean everything then pushes forward? They both have to agree to the summary judgment? No, you don't have to agree to summary judgment. You have to put forth reasons why summary judgment is not. You have to put forth once okay. the moving party shows that it believes it's entitled to a summary judgment, then you have to say, actually, there are factual stuff here that makes this case not right for summary judgment. You have to tell the court what facts are in dispute and why a trial is necessary. If if no party tells the court that there's anything in dispute, the court is, well, okay, the parties agree on everything. Okay. So when we move for and, summary and, judgment, we told the court there was nothing factually that was in dispute. Sure. And, okay, so we could, we, would we, I don't want to drag this out for forever. If we had said we dispute this thing, the, the judge could have still said, I'm awarding summary judgment? Well, on our motion, we wouldn't have disputed anything because we made the motion. So we are okay. telling the judge yeah, yeah, yeah. there's nothing in dispute. On When they made their motion, we could have said, you should deny theirs because their facts are in dispute. We didn't do that either. Okay. So so each party has to respond to the other party's motion. Okay. That's kind of what I was, okay. I think that's what I was asking. So, I gotcha. so, so yes. And, and if, if they don't identify any material fact in dispute, the court assumes there is no, there are no facts in dispute. But the court hmm. eloquently well, stated in the opinion that there were facts that, that, that weren't facts, that they, that they just, that there, there just wasn't enough there. We, 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 didn't, we didn't have the facts in terms of what the right of way is. We didn't establish that. I got gotcha. you. I don't have anything else. I, and I, you know, we've been doing this for like 45 minutes. I think we are, we are done beating this thing to death. All right. Well, then, 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 then do we have a, a dozen new patrons this week? We did receive one new patron this week and want to send out a huge thank you to Eugene for coming a new patron. Thank you so very much, Eugene. Mr. Uh, the Deputy HMFIC in chat has counted and you have done three hands on the Bibles tonight. So if this were a drinking game, he would be under the table. <laughs> so he's got to learn how to pronounce Bible. It's Bible. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I think he's from up north, so there's no Bible. He's, uh, he just says Bible. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Larry, you, you have delivered us with crappy news yet again. Can't you ever be happy and bring us good news and be happy about the good news? Well, I could be. <laughs> uh, Larry, how can uh, people uh, find the podcast? Uh, may, may, can, we, can we take a quick detour about that? We, there was a phone call that was received today about this podcast at, I'm just going to say the wrong number. Okay. And uh, they left a message saying that they wanted to, to uh, a, a prisoner had submitted a question and it was answered and the prisoner wanted uh, his mother to hear the, the answer. And uh, the, yes, I, I immediately called the person back and the person didn't answer the phone. And I tried multiple times throughout the day and the person never answered their phone. And uh, so I, I, for the life of me, I don't understand if you, if you call and specifically say, would y'all call me back? And then you don't answer your phone. I don't understand how that works. How would you ever get the call back if you don't answer the phone? They immediately went and took a very long hot bath. For the entire day? Uh, all day. All pruny fingers and all. Well, see, I've, I've lived long enough to where phones were the primary means of communication for most of my life. And now everybody has such a phone aversion. And when I survey people, I get various answers. But the one that I get most often is, oh, I, I, I might have to deal with something I don't want to deal with. And I said, well, just press that little button that says end, and that'll end the call, and you won't have to deal with it anymore. And people tell me, well, I'm, I'm busy. I, I don't want to be disruption. I said, well, just like anything else, just ignore it if you're busy. But don't just have a blanket policy that you never answer the phone. Because if you got an unwanted call, you can separate yourself from that unwanted call. And there are people who never, ever, ever answer their phone anymore. And I don't ever answer, answer my phone. 
I know. I'm, 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 I'm poking fun at you. I mean, there's people that never answer their phone anymore. They have all sorts of software and interceptors and everything that says the, the party's not receiving calls. And, and I don't understand. My, my family's that way. And neither of them work. And they say that they're afraid that, this, that they're going to have to deal with stuff. I said, what would, you, what would you not be able to extricate yourself from? If the call is unwanted, just end the call. But they feel like they have to have permission to end the call. The only calls I don't like answering are the calls that come to the office of the senator because I'm not allowed to end those calls. And therefore, when I'm in something I can't get out of, I prefer not to get into it. But on my personal phone, I can end any call at any time. So it's easier to me if I get, I've been called in the last week, I probably got a dozen calls about my warranty on my car is about to expire. And each time it comes from a different number and each time when it starts, I just hit end and, and, and I'm done with it. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, man. I don't answer any calls. That way I don't have to worry about all that. So, well, but but see, you told me that you texted the person back. How do you know I did. that that phone received text? You texted them, but, but had they not responded, which I'm assuming they did respond, but if you didn't get a text back, how would you know that that had been handled without, without uh, talking to them? Usually landlines will bounce back and say that this is a landline and can't receive text messages. Usually oh. that happens. Oh, okay. So you would have known. I, I assume I would have known, but I took my meth measures plus plus what you can't do on the phone, which I mean, you can do, but it would require a lot of writing is I sent this person links to the podcast so that they could find where exactly to listen to it. So, well, fantastic. And they could just click on them in their phone. So The whole fan- other reason that I brought this up to you was that uh, we got criticized. God, this is forever ago that we got too political and we started getting hate mail. Narsal started getting hate mail. So there's a disclaimer at the beginning of the program that says this is an independent program. Like we are not part of them. I granted, we kind of cross paths very regularly, but now people are calling Narsal for questions to the podcast, which I find kind of ironic. So, well, there is, there is a lot of uh, uh, overlap because of we operate from the same post office box, all the mail that's come to the podcast, and we are getting mail now, is all coming to the same PO box, so it confuses people. Well, all right, so people can find this at registrymatters.co. That is the uh, website where to find all of the things. And, you know, were you to do uh, some Google searching for the podcast, then you might show that uh, that might show up too. If you type in registry matters, you will definitely find the website. Uh, how about how about your favorite thing, Larry, voicemail? Where do people call to get voicemail? Seven four seven two two seven four four seven seven. The email address is registrymatterscast at gmail dot com. And if we don't get another patron this coming week, then I guess we'll just shut the whole thing down. And I'm poking fun. But Larry, where do people support the podcast? At patreon dot com slash registrymatters. Fantastic. We love our patrons very much. They, uh, they make this whole thing very worthwhile, and I appreciate each and every one of you very, very much, and all of our listeners. We had a crap ton of the YouTube people this week on uh, last week's episode, like a whole lot. Yeah, it's, a, it's pushing 400. Good grief, that's a lot. With all that, Larry, um, as usual, you are a master blaster of information about all things related to this issue, <laughs> and we wouldn't be able to do it without you. And I appreciate it very much. And I hope you have the great rest of your weekend. You're going to go out and, and scare people and dress up as, I don't know, like Godzilla or something. I am indeed. Excellent. Thank you as always, Larry. I appreciate it very much. Have a great weekend. Good night. Bye. You've been listening to FYP.